Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand, and today we're over at Clark University in the Trena Center for the Visual and Performing Arts. And I have a very distinguished guest, uh, Matt Malski, who is the chairman of the Department of Visual and Performing Arts here at Clark. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm so impressed with the music programs that I see in your programs for the springs this year. Oh, well, thank you, and, uh, and welcome to Clark. Uh, gee, I think uh, this April, I noticed seven performances here at uh, Razzo Hall. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's a wonderful uh, music hall. It's, wouldn't you say the sound and all is quite it, it's really It's really an extraordinary treasure in Worcester, and I think one that, um, that isn't known as well as it, it ought to be, that, um, that the hall itself is really extraordinary. It's about eight years old now, um, and we're, um, we're in the Trana Center for the Arts, which is just at the edge of the Clark campus, that, which is a, a renovated uh, 19th century Worcester schoolhouse. So just to the side of us, there's a beautiful uh, brick building, and then uh, the, the Razzo Hall was built as the one new piece of the construction. So it's an entirely um, uh, newly conceived, and it was very carefully designed in, in terms of the acoustics, and, and it's a really almost a perfect place to hear chamber music. In terms of the uh, architecture, it wouldn't seem that this glass lobby and very contemporary building would be so compatible, but it really looks quite lovely with the Downing Street School. That's where I taught years ago, but, yeah. but it's a beautiful old building and together they seem to have a new, a new uh, reality about them. Yeah, know? no, I think it, um, it, it works wonderfully well as, a, as a, both a teaching space and as a performance space and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the architects were, were very sensitive to the idea of flowing out of the old building, people moving out of the old building into the new mm -hmm. space. And, the concerts that they give here are free and really, uh, as you said, it's a wonderful gem that a lot of people don't take advantage of or know about. Right. The hall is used in a number of different capacities. It's, uh, it's both a classroom um, for art history and for screen studies as well as an exhibition space, so there are screenings. Um, at lectures there, but um, I, I'm, as a musician, I'm most excited about the performances, and, and we really have a, a wonderful variety of different kinds of concerts that, of course, we have student ensembles, so at Clark we have um, a concert band, a string orchestra, um, a full concert choir, and a, a smaller, more elite um, chamber choir. Um, and a jazz ensemble. And a jazz ensemble, and many of those perform here. Um, we also have a very active program in uh, private instruction, and so we have student recitals, so there's an enormous amount of student activity. But we also have um, pro uh, a really an extraordinary level of professional uh, performance that goes on here. So this Saturday, the program uh, is being offered by two of our faculty members, uh, Malcolm Halliday and Chester Bresniak, who are performing with a singer who's from New York City, Robert Osborne. Um, and they're performing a, a song of mine called The Great Lover. Um, but later in the uh, semester, we have um, Navel uh, Nerosian, who is uh, coming from the Moscow Conservatory. He's a faculty member in piano at the Moscow Conservatory, and he'll be performing here. It's really what an extraordinary- What a wonderful opportunity to hear these outstanding uh, musicians. Exactly. Um, there is a, a, a chamber ensemble called the Capital Trio coming from upstate New York that will be performing on April 1st, um, and a, a trio of piano, clarinet, and cello, for example, that involves both faculty and uh, world-class musicians that are gonna be here at the beginning of April. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd, I'd really encourage people to, to look at the schedule and, and uh, come and down and join us. And they can see that online, they get the exact times. Usually they're 7.30 in, in the Razzo Center. That's right, Razzo that's Hall. right. Uh, so tell us just a little bit more about the number of students or the, fact, the structure of your programs. Or sure. Uh, we're, we're a little bit unusual in terms of the, the organization that we have uh, um, an umbrella department of visual and performing arts that has five different majors. So each major has its own curriculum and its own activities, and we share facilities, and we're, we're an arts collective, essentially, a community. So we're, in addition to music, uh, programs in art history, in studio art, in theater, and uh, screen studies, 
and all of those programs or most of those programs have both a production component where students are making art as well as a scholarly component where they're studying history and, and criticism More of the analytical arts. analytical and right. yes and you've really been guiding that program for you said you were at Clark for how many years? Well I've been here 17 years and for the last three I've been both the director of the music program and the chair of the whole department. Uh -huh. um, and within the music program we, um, we have three full-time faculty members and about 25 uh, uh, adjunct faculty who uh, teach lessons and direct ensembles on and specific teach other instruments classes. and right. voice and things like right. that. And we have concentrations in music composition and theory, in music technology, um, which is my area, in um, history and criticism, and uh, performance as well. You were saying that some of your compositions, even though you're primarily a chamber composing for chamber or, uh, musicians, mm -hmm. you also use technology? That, you... That's really my, uh, one of my main interests, that I'm, I'm most interested in combining acoustic instruments with computer technology that's, that's able to listen to what the live performers are playing and respond and add to the ensemble. So the computer becomes essentially an additional musical element in, in the performance and it's all done in real time, it's all done live. Sort of like Photoshop for the visual arts? Well, you might think about it that way. A little augmentation here, yeah, a little uh, repetition there. There's, there's all sorts of ways that, that you can, uh, can use the technology, uh -huh. that it can uh, play back pre-recorded things, but it can also do very sophisticated kinds of processing and, um, and spatial movements. Um, so it, uh, it's, if you haven't heard it, it's, uh, it's an unusual and I think very exciting and, and uh, very contemporary kind of uh, way to make music. I'm anxious to hear that. Ah, okay. So when, when will your work be played in April? Um, at Clark, um, my, I have a new piece for um, clarinet, piano, and cello that's going to be done on April 3rd. Um, and that's um, in addition to the piece that's this weekend, that's what um, I'm offering the program here, but I have mm -hmm. Uh, pieces being played in uh, in New York in in March and uh, in Europe later on in the spring. Wow, that's wonderful. Well, I'm definitely going to be here April 3rd, 7:30, because I want to hear that. Uh, it sounds like a wonderful program. Well, great, thank you. Well, uh, this is about all we have time for today. But I really want to thank you for taking some time to uh, tell us about the Department of Music in, at Clark. Uh, my thank pleasure, you, Matt Malski. Thank you very much. in the Little Center at Clark University, and uh, I'm talking to Gino Diorio, who is theater program director uh, of I get the theater program here yeah, at Clark. Right, right. And what, what's the accurate name of this? Uh, it's theater? the Michelson Theater at uh, uh -huh. Clark University at, at Little Center Theater. And how would you describe this kind of theater setup? Well, this is kind of an interesting space. Uh, most of the time we call this a black box, but believe it or not, this was actually a dining hall when it was first construction, constructed back in the 60s. And it was modified into a theater. It's kind of our all purpose. Uh, black box space. We do most of our main stage, actually I'd say nine, we, every now and then we'll do a show over in Atwood Hall, but most of our main stage shows are here. And how many shows do you do a year? Three main stage shows. So okay. we'll do, uh, let's see, last uh, fall we did a show by Greg Moss called Punk Play, and uh, this uh, particular show now, which opens uh, tomorrow night, is uh, Tales of the Lost Four Micans, which is a show by Connie Congdon, and it's directed by Kate Lohman. And then later on in the spring, in April, we're doing a play called A Piece of My Heart, which is a show about uh, women's experience in Vietnam, and that was written by Shirley Loro 
and directed by Andrea Southwick. I can't believe I got all that right. So and Kate go. Lohman mm -hmm. is a visiting director, she so you a, pull yeah. people in from outside we always the do, area. Yeah. Kate, That's Kate's a fine it. actress. Uh, she directed for us uh, a number of years ago. We're happy to have her back. She's uh, situated in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. She's a commercial actress down there. She also does a lot of improv. She also teaches improv for us, so she does a lot of stuff here. I know that the students get a chance to do quite a bit of uh, hands-on in every mm -hmm. area of theater. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, they're, they're, pre they're pretty active. I mean, uh, uh, I think Laura Menzer, who you're going to speak to in a couple of minutes, uh, she not only uh, acts in shows, she also directs. A lot of the, uh, Chelsea Long, is, uh, who's in tonight's production, uh, she's also a playwright and a director. So it's not uncommon to have a, a, a theater student do a lot of different things. Um, as I, I mentioned before, we have a, a, a new play festival. Uh, every other year we produce uh, uh, full-length productions of student works. Last spring we did nine, which is probably too many. Uh, we'll probably do less, uh, less next spring. Uh, but this, uh, this coming spring we're actually doing a couple of new shows, uh, new plays by uh, student playwrights also, um, some readings as well. So there's always a lot of theater going on. We, we generate a lot of new work, but we also produce some, uh, some works that are already established as well. Wonderful. Yeah. And then you're doing plays uh, on campus also with the music department. Yeah, um, Clark Musical Theater is a student-run group. Uh, they uh, produce a musical at least once every semester. Uh, let's see, uh, this semester they're doing a musical called Curtains. Last uh, fall they produced um, uh, uh, spelling so, the, so right? this would be so. for voice students as well? And not, not always. Not really? it's, uh, sometimes. A lot of music students get involved. Actually, more music students get involved in the musical um, in the band, right? Okay. Uh, uh, they'll just, usually it's a, it, the, the band is student run. Most of the kids up on stage, are not a, they're non-majors and majors as well. So That's great. Yeah. So what do they do? Just have like an open audition? Or? They have an open audition. They'll often hire uh, directors from out of town. Sometimes it's a student director. Um, they, they so really, that's nice because the student can kind of do it as extracurricular yeah. enjoyment. Really. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a situation where advanced students are teaching the younger students and it's a really good situation. Uh, Clark Musical Theater is really, uh, they've improved a great deal over the years. This stuff mm -hmm. gets better all the time. So. And the students help with the uh, costume mm -hmm. preparation? Yeah, and the set building, and the, the set building, yeah, everything, and right. the whole business. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. Yeah. So. Well, nice to meet you. Great meeting and, you, And uh, I look Thanks forward so to seeing the show. Okay. So we have two leading ladies here that are actually appearing in tonight's production, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I have Laura Menzi, who, uh, and also Chelsea Long, and they're both theater majors here at Clark. Um, so I kind of am curious just to know how that has been for you. You've, you've done how many plays? About five, I think five plays. And this is all the heavy drama in this group, right? <laughs> or is this a comedy? It's hard to mix. say. It's hard to say. You'll laugh. You'll cry. You'll have a great that's, time. That's what we want. <laughs> drama. Drama. So, and how many plays have you done, Chelsea? Um, well, I've been in a few, uh, probably four maybe, and I've directed two. Wow! And I have written a play, which, which awesome. my dear friend Laura directed. Awesome. <laughs> so you guys have a great history of experiences here at Clark. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well. Uh, I look forward to seeing the, the program, and uh, are you planning to make a career in the theater? I hope that's so. That's the, yeah, that's the Boy, plan. That's good the plan. question. Good question. <laughs> well, good luck with that. Thank I hope you. That, uh, I hope that I see your name up in lights. <laughs> You were so positive. I know. You were so sure. I know. It's incredible. You're telling me. Two Corvettes that look that much alike? And what was that, that Cambodian? You said he was from Thailand. Whatever, some skinny oriental guy. What was he doing parking a car like that on a residential street? He probably foolishly thought it would be safe here. It, well, they don't know anything. They're just asking questions. What was he doing with a Corvette anyway? What do we do? Well, Jagger's got a way into the police computer. If it comes to that. No way, I'm not encouraging that kid. He's scary enough already. We might be arrested. They know it's two women. They know it's two women. They know it's two women? How do they know that? They heard giggling. 
Now we're in the Schilt Camp Gallery at the Trainer Center for the Arts, and uh, I, my guest now is Ellie Crocker, who is a professor of art at Clark, and also the gallery director, and you are also the curator for this show, which is just beautiful. It's a wonderful show. Tell us, tell us about the show, because I'm so anxious to have the audience know. Thank you, Susan. Yes, this show called Woodwork is up through April 17th here at the Shulkamp Gallery at the Trainer Center for the Arts at Clark University. And uh, this is a collaborative effort really uh, with, between myself and a group of about 10 students who are gallery interns. Uh, all of them are either studio art or art history majors. And we looked at work in artist studios and uh, CDs that were sent to us by the artists and selected work for this exhibition. Uh, it was especially fun for them to be able to visit the studios of a number of artists who live in the area. We Wonderful. weren't able to get to everybody's studio because actually some of the exhibiting artists come from as far away as Indiana and New York City. Uh, but uh, the ones who are in the Boston um, area, we, we were able to visit their studios. Oh, that must have been great it's experience great. for the students. Uh, what I really like about this show is the way you have such a diversity. I mean, here it's all wood, but each artist's vision is so distinctive and so completely original. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm loving the show. Yeah. There are 10 different artists, and uh, it is true that we selected their work based on the different approaches they take to wood. Uh -huh. Some of them are, are building things, as Bob Lewis is doing, for example, here, where he's constructing uh, these, these temples, if you will, out of various <laughs> kinds of wood and pieces of wood, and then gilding them with gold leaf. And then we have artists such as Donna Dodson, who is carving these uh, pieces out of tree trunks and not actually building at all. It's all glyptic or a subtractive sculpture. Uh, so there are a lot of different approaches. Some of them are very um, whimsical and some of them are um, actually have a didactic message of some kind, uh, really speaking about um, issues dealing with our current times and ecology. Uh, one of the questions people might be asking is why a show about wood? And uh, this actually came out of some conversations we had about the fact that it seems like in this day and age where technology has affected everything in our lives, including art making for artists, that there is a, a resurgence of interest in material. Um, real stuff. Yes, real stuff. In real making stuff. In objects. <laughs> objects. Stuff yes. you can grab and feel and smell and not just virtual. That relates to our bodies in some yeah, way. And yeah. uh, so there is this sense that, it, and not to in any way diminish the importance or impact sure. of uh, new technologies. Uh, and I'm sure that many of these artists, in fact, employ them to a mm -hmm. certain degree. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea was to, to go back to something that's more primal and yes. the, this instinct to make objects. That and, and physicality yes. is it's just has such presence and it's so sensual. Yes. The, the wood is has a warmth and every piece is unique. It's it's wonderful. Yes, and, and actually in thinking about it, we were we, we couldn't have a show that involved too many different materials. So we thought about wood as being perhaps the oldest, most ancient and primal yeah. of all materials that it artists have worked all with. That kind of mystical association of the tree and yes and it, it's accessible to everybody people understand what wood is what wood can do uh, wood of course has uh, for as long as human beings have been on this planet we've employed wood in various ways uh, wood um, Meaning trees, warms has, us, has feeds us, us, shelters us. Absolutely, all of those <laughs> all things. Of so, um, and there's also a corollary that it offers with the human body, in that uh, some of the, the the nomenclature even refers to body, a trunk, limbs, That's heart, right. That's right. Um, and so on. And and just like our bodies, uh, there is this organic quality where we understand that. Uh, 
the wood grows and changes and ultimately decays. Yes. Uh, so there is that sense too of um, there is a kind of solidity to this, but also a sense of the, um, the organic mortality of the form. Yeah. And yet the tree was often thought of as something that connected to the divine or reached to the heavens yes. or because it outlived men, it uh, was thought to be such, you know, they worship trees as well. Yes, and, and actually many uh, people, uh, ancient peoples and even people now believe that there are special animistic properties sure. uh, to trees. And uh, there was a belief in hamadryads, which are tree spirits, um, or as you say, certain kinds of wood possessing healing powers, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, artists, uh, again, from the beginning of time, would make objects that had sacred properties. Um, they weren't necessarily considered artists. They might have been shamans or something in sure. the culture. Uh, but uh, a lot of this work harkens back, I, I would say especially Donna Dodson's, to these kinds of of um, to totem-like, primal, um, primal um, mythical figures, mythical figures yeah. right, right, and and really using the grain of the wood as part of the work. I mean, she's really, in some ways, emphasizing that these come from trees. I mean, we still sense the tree there in her mm -hmm. work. Uh, we mm -hmm. see the grain. We we can sense the shape of the trunk. Uh, we know its its width in a way. Mm -hmm. And she even talks about the fact that a lot of this wood comes from special places, so that it has some significance to her when she she's carving these pieces. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that informs the direction that the work goes in. Mm -hmm. I'm very uh, fond of these little uh, kind of bubble-like balls that are floating the, on the wall and the uh, square boxes. And By Rosemary Broughton Boyle, yes. Rosemary Boyle, the, uh, those just, I love those. The way they come, they seem to flutter down. Yes. If there's such a tension between the object being in midair and coming out of the wall, and, and yet the physical form of it is so beautiful. Yeah, they seem to defy gravity. Yeah. In fact, the one with the cubes, uh, she's talking about um, constellations. And, and this idea of the kind of random patterning, patterning of stars in the sky. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's, a, there's definitely a whimsical quality to her work. I also um, love the fact that she gave us boxes of her work with a note saying, um, have a gay old time putting these up as you see fit. She gave us a diagram for how she had it in her studio, but allowed the students to have some input as to how they would be installed in this particular space. Oh, wonderful. So it's very um, <laughs> site specific because it looked very different in her studio. She had a completely different kind of space. It actually was in an inverted corner as opposed to in this space where it's going around the outside of some yeah. corners. And it, I think it looks fabulous. Um, and some artists need to be very, very specific with how they install their work. And in fact, a few of the artists came and did it themselves. But other artists allow uh, some input from the curators and the gallery interns. Ellie, whose work is this? This is Stefan Falks, and he lives in Brooklyn, New York. And what's so interesting about his work is that all of the wood that he uses, he finds. He scavenges. So he finds it in dumpsters in Brooklyn, and he scours New Low York City. Low overhead. Yes. He says he never pays for materials. So these beautiful polished boxes that look like fine, elegant pieces of furniture with all of this different uh, kind of wood, all these different colors, it's all scavenged wood that he's got. And that's the natural color of the wood itself, no, no, no tinting. He no, he hasn't stained it at all. This is all Amazing. the natural color of the wood. So you see walnut and cherry and oak and maple and goodness knows what else. So uh, that is what's so fascinating to me about his work. The design is very, uh, almost like pulsating as well. It is, it is. And actually, I think we use this piece for the uh, announcement for the card about the show because it really speaks of wood. It, it almost, um, to me, is it like the tree rings of, of yes. you know, uh, the different years a tree has been alive. So I think that is- It's a, almost a like a vibration yes. too, though. It's this, it, uh, like a sound wave or something. I love these works. Who, who, what, who is this artist? This is Rob Millard Mendez. And though he has Boston roots, he is actually living and working, he's teaching in, um, in Indiana. So he sent these to us uh, via the mail. And um, these, these are wonderful. He describes them as large toys, although they make wry comments about human interactions. Um, and in fact, they are puppets. Uh, he invites some interaction with viewers, although it should be gentle. This is called Id Puppet. And um, a lot of them have some kind of ironic commentary on 
the world at large. For example, this one is called Sarah Palin as Callie. Callie is the consort, Callie. Yes, <laughs> as the consort of Shiva and is a kind of fierce Good female one. deer Good deer. body. Yes. Um, and uh, she actually is usually depicted with multiple arms holding different kinds of weapons um, and, and uh, other objects. And so this one uh, is, is really quite remarkable. And uh, they're, they're, you know, they're meant to be taken with uh, a sense of humor, but at the same time he is making uh, some, some commentary What on. are these little skulls made out of? Are they made of bone? Well, he says they bone, look like teeth. Bone is one of the ingredients here. It says wood, plastic, metal, paint, and bone. So those are carved out of bone? Yes. It's amazing. Oh, my isn't God. It? I actually, one of the things I've enjoyed about this show is thinking about the different ways that artists are working in their studios. Uh, this is, to me, is so much more playful, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yes than, and no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all, all art making involves some aspect of play. Uh, but I agree. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, there's, uh, there's a student curated show upstairs in this building that'll be up for a little while called the um, show about toys. So I think there is a kind of interest also in that, in the way that that uh, the creative process, in many respects, involves playing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, uh, I think that that shows in these works, and yet they have the dark side as well. Yes, they definitely I love have a that dark this side. one is all all the body parts are made out of hands. Yes, the feet are hands. Everything is hands. Yeah, very and, yeah, very interesting yes. stuff. And this, this piece is uh, by Rod Millard Mendez as well. Okay. Well, this has been wonderful, Ellie. I just wish I had scheduled three hours to look at this show <laughs> with you because I love hearing your comments. Uh, it's been a pleasure looking at the work with you, and thank you for having us. Well, I really appreciate your interest, okay. Susan, and I yeah, hope my that pleasure. your viewing audience will come see the exhibit Yeah, it's themselves. here. It's here through April 18th. April 17th, 17th is the last day, yes. So thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you again next time for another edition of Arts and Ideas. Mm -hmm.